Uh, you know what they say, you go and get some earbuds, and you leave with a new phone, some furniture, and a guy named Bob that, not sure if he even likes his family, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, I had a, something interesting happen the other night, story time, I was at the laundromat. And I promise, it connects to everything that happened today. Because I literally was thinking about this. It's weird how everything really is a domino effect. Hmm. Kind of like my old job. Kind of pays more than my current one. And much easier. And much more free time. Oh, don't give me too much time to think. Um, <laughs> I was at the laundromat. And it was the end of the into the whole situation you know you wash your dry clothes you get people giving you awkward stares because you accidentally use the biggest washer for no fucking reason and some guy comes in there five minutes after with a big old thing of laundry stuff and he just gives you this look non-verbally and you just felt highly uncomfortable because you're sitting there in discomfort like yep i'm the asshole that could have used these 18 other washers and i used the one that should have been left for you but the point is, is that as I was putting my earbuds back in the case, one of them dropped, I dropped the case and one of them went under a door and the door was locked. And so I chalked it up to the game. You know what? Fuck. I guess there's no way I could actually talk to people. Fast forward. Today, I went to go get some earbuds. Because, you know, I just figured it's all gone. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to have a lighthearted day. I'm not going to do anything of significance. I'm not going to go exercise. I'm not going to go work on anything. It's going to pick up this one thing, have some alone time, and, you know, just actually do little to nothing. Not spend any money, nothing like that. Something that's going to be a $15 to $20 trip turn into a $280 situation. Um, <laughs> uh, this is how we get them in America. But I think God wanted me to do this, you know. He's all about, you know, upping your 14 times what you plan on spending that day, you know. You try to follow the Dave Ramsey budgeting model and God's like, nah, I got something else for you. So, I only walk in the Best Buy for a few minutes. Didn't even, barely found the headphone section. The second I go there, this very joyous man in this nice blue, I thought he worked for Best Buy shirt. And that's where I fucked up. And I'm not exaggerating. When this nice little uh, Forrest Galante looking fucker said, Hey, you look young. I'm not even joking. That's exactly what the man said. Hey, you look young. And I felt like, you know, a middle-aged woman when uh, attractive men compliments. I'm like, well, I, I guess I do. Um, <laughs> um, feel like a young stud. Well, studs kind of, you know, in and out. Um, <laughs> oh... You know, it's weird how Best Buy doesn't have vibrating dildos. You would think that would... Well, they sure have batteries. They sure have things you could probably charge it with. Yeah. Sorry. Sidetrack. Moisture free. Um, <laughs> like those moisture wicking jackets, they call it. Alright. Sorry. Um, as Drake would say, uh, I put my hands in his pocket. He wasn't joking around. Um... <laughs> Uh, and this guy wasn't. He was all business. He's like, what phone you got? And I'm thinking, this is just some random ass guy interested in my phone. I'm like, well, it's actually funny you ask. I pull out my phone. This man thought he saw like King Tut, like an, or, like an ancient artifact. He's like, would you like to sign up? Would you like to get a new phone today? I'm like, would I like to? Sure. Am I going to? Not in the slightest. Well, an hour and a half later, somehow this man has convinced me, sodomized me, and seduced me, and I actually got a new phone. Much needed. But then, 
You know, sometimes you get in the momentum of, and this is how they get you, man. You're comfortable spending one dollar, you'll be comfortable spending two, then four. And you're just like, ah, fuck it, my life's over anyways. You know, you almost treat it like it's your last day on earth, fuck it, right? So I walk out of there, and then I finally get my earbuds. Now, as I'm walking out, I see this nice furniture mart. And I'm like, yeah, you know what? I got some time to kill. I got nothing else to do today. My whole day's already been fucked. Might as well fuck it a little bit more. Let me be one of those assholes that look at furniture that I'm never going to buy. I go inside, and 38 minutes later, Bob strangled me to get a chair. Um, (laughs) No, but Bob, the guy at the furniture store, is actually very helpful. He didn't force me to buy anything. You know, he did a little salesman pitch, you know, and I hate, because I remember when I got my vehicle. God, like, you walk onto a lot, and these fucking assholes are just like piranhas. They don't even, like, let you speak. They don't even let you look at... They just start directing you to areas. That's one that I respect about Bob. He, like, he asked what I was looking for. He's like, hey, this is where we got this and that. You know, but please take your time. Look around. And I like I like when people give you an idea of what you're looking for, where they are, but they still let you roam around. They're not hovering over everything you fucking look at trying to convince you. Because I think being sold something is one of the biggest turnoffs ever. Like, honestly, the biggest turnoff to me is when someone's trying to sell me something. You know, give me the information, convince me, maybe a little bit, but don't sell me. The more you try to sell me, the more it's like you're trying to make something look better than it is. Let the product speak for itself. You know? I think he was probably looking at me, probably not thinking I could afford anything in there. And he was right for about 95% of the stuff. But, you know, as he said, just finance it. I'm like, I'm sure that's guy, I'm sure that's in your lingo. Yeah, just finance it. And this man even tried to tell me. Because he tried to show me these electrical massage chairs that were, I'm not even exaggerating, $8,000 fucking dollars. And they didn't even look all that cool, but they were definitely creative in a way. I was like, like, yeah, you know what, that may be out of my budget. And he's like, he looked at me like I was crazy. He's like, you know, I just sold a 19-year-old this. And I'm like, did you sell it to him or, you know, put a gun to his head? Or uh, try to out his data. So his dad sees his browsing history and is like, damn it, Chad. I knew you were a little gay. Um, (laughs) But he's like, and I told him what to do. You get this chair, finance it. You'll be the coolest guy on campus because this guy goes to, this kid apparently goes to a college nearby. You have this in your dorm room. Everyone's going to want to come to your dorm room. Charge them 20 bucks to sit in it. I'm like, if people are broke in a dorm room, I don't think people are really going to be like, oh, bro, let me spend 20 I know I have $24 in my bank account, but can I sit in your chair for half an hour? Like, like they're going to turn into fucking Dr. Doom or some shit after sending. But overall, nice guy. Um, not sure he really loved his family. I think kind of resents a few things. But at the same time, very loving. You ever, you know, you ever like, well, I know it's like, I went to four different places today, and I had wholesome interactions at every single place. And I don't want to sound like I'm to my own horn, but you know, they always say, you can always look at the common denominator of the situation and get the pulse of the room. I think everywhere I go, I make people feel better. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm not that much of a into myself asswipe. But what I will say is, I think uh, Bob smiled talking to me. And I don't think he smiles at too many guys in their 20s. I feel like he's a lot of resentment towards young men. Because he's like, he remembers when he was young, but then he had kids. He paid for a big-ass wedding. Sorry for outing this guy's information, but, you know, no one knows where the fuck I am. And this man just started listing all of his daughters and how... He just went through him like he had no, this man, he's just like he needed someone he respected to talk to. It was almost like he was trying to convince me like, yeah, you know, this one picked a good one. My youngest has a uh, partner or she has a boy. That's a friend. He's a nice guy. 
basically calling him, you know, a young puss. And then his middle child. It's always the middle child that make the worst decisions, right? Damn, I am a middle child. Uh Oh. But he said she picked a terrible one. And he gave me this look like, like, yeah, I don't know if I could fix that. Um, trying to get furniture from my current lady. And that's enough. More than enough. Now, if you, uh, I can make you believe that your daughter has a chance if you give me some really good discounts on these couches, my friend. Oh, please. I will have someone do all the dirty texting for me. Um... <laughs> Because, hey, 50% off is 50% off, right? Um, <laughs> uh, but, yeah. You know, it was weird because I had great I had a conversation with a guy who's in his mid to late 30s who just moved with a couple kids, you know. Then this old 70-year-old guy who, you know, definitely tells just tired, exhausted, Resenting a lot of things, has no problem telling you how he feels about how his life's going, but you kind of feel that wholesome energy from him. You know, he just needed someone to talk to. And then, I met a young whippersnapper. By a young whippersnapper, I mean a dude two years younger than me. When I went to go pick up something after this whole event, this man was a general manager of a place. At 26. It's pretty impressive stuff. And this man, the second I walked in, he's asked me, you know, I, would, would you like to try this? You know, really asking me about me, asking me, see, this is how guys, you know, the guys know what works. Anytime you, you want to bust through and make a guy feel his ego rise up, be like, don't say, do you work out? Say, where do you work out? Because that automatically assumes, come on, let's cut, come on, man, look at you. You know, he asks, where do you work out? I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And that's the way you get to a man's heart. Make him feel bigger than he is. Um, <laughs> uh, and then he's like, you know, I run a ministry. We have, uh, we're trying to find some young leaders. And I'm like, some young, powerful leaders. And he said, I think you would be someone. You seem like someone that, you know, I would like to work out with and maybe talk more about this. And I'm like... Yeah, I don't know if you want me speaking up because, uh, you know, I could give a lot of good general stuff, you know, stuff that's not too spiritually in tune. But once you want to start talking about what God can do for you, you might be disappointed where the guidance leads. I'll be giving more of the no guidance vibe from Drake and CB. (laughs) Uh, Fuck around and I'll give you my last name. I think that's what Jesus did, right? I don't know. I didn't read. But yeah. Anyways. My whole putting this together. This whole opening unnecessary monologue. Is me losing that one single fucking earbud. Caused me to do a lot of things I didn't want to do. But I feel much more at ease. It was almost like God like made my hands slippery. He made me tired as fuck from the day before to be exhausted doing that thing. And so I would not be clear-minded and I would drop my headphones, lose it. He would know because of my phone situation, I have to go get an earbud. And because of that, I ran into someone who convinced me to buy my gullible ass a fucking whole nother payment plan of shit. Then, ah, fuck. Let me get, it's like God, like, you know, sometimes God puts all these things on our hands. Then he has me run into, it's almost like a conclusion like the the general manager, the guy who's leading a ministry of young men is now like it was almost like God was speaking through and be like, hey, you know, I'm the one that puts you on this journey today. Right. It's like he was speaking through him, you know, whether you're a believer or not, it's undeniable that losing one waxy earbud <laughs> can uh. Fuck your whole bank account, but it can also get shit done that you wouldn't have done yourself. So yeah, the moral of all that is, is 
Jesus, I got robbed today. So yeah, welcome to episode 294 of the Off and Be podcast with Clint Nelson. I think 294. Who gives a fuck? It's been fucking like 18 days since I recorded. Welcome to episode 294 of the Off and Be podcast with Clint Nelson. I'm your host, Clint Nelson. Don't forget to like, follow, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell, most poor ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Don't forget to suck some titties. Yeah. Recording this on August 16th, 2024 at 9.18 p.m. Eastern for the archives. Uh, Today's drink of choice is Ghost Sour Pink Womenade. Uh, It's like a good old hummingbird in my tummy right now. A lot of chirping, a lot of bubbling, and uh, a lot of sightseeing. But yeah, but speaking of now having unlimited gigabytes on my phone, um, let's just say, I think he said I got 128 gigabytes, so let's minus 28 and just focus on the most important 100 gigabytes in the world right now. Drake. Um, <laughs> I'll be honest, right? I've watched some of the footage of the Drake leak. Not really leak, he leaked it. And also now, his label, the same label that's paying four to five hundred million, you know the one he brags about, major distribution, five hundred million just for Aubrey. Well, I guess we're learning that there's a price to pay for that. Has he tried to secret leak it? You know, through whatever. And his record label's like, no, 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 oh no, it's leaked. That's fine, but um, we're gonna make sure we profit off this. So they put those three songs that he dropped as. Legitimate songs are now part of his discography. And so, yeah. Um, I think it's a two for three. No one cares about the Lotto song. Can we just be honest? It's the least impressive is the definition of trying to recreate that sexy red energy. Except, you know, Lotto's not really a sexy red type of energy gal, you know. Oh, and by the way. Suki Hana. <laughs> I don't know why I said it like that. Suki Hana. As you know, I don't know if y'all know. Depends who my audience is. I mean, if you know, you know. But chances are, you know. Um, Suki Hana is this rapper slash social media influencer type of thing. She basically is known for, um, what do we call it? She has a nice spread on her. Now that I've seen it. That's her image. She likes to be very expressive with her body. Has no problem with the nudity. And apparently she's starting to come to a full revelation about decisions she's made. And one of the things I came across, like someone did a little screen image. Or it was like on one of these gossiping YouTube pages things. And literally she made a tweet. Essentially summarizing that she wishes someone would have been there to tell her no about decisions she made with tattoos on her body. Specifically, she's talking about having a machine gun tattooed on her ass. And I don't think you really need a second opinion to know that getting a machine gun tatted on your ass is the best idea. I don't think you really need that. But, you know, through the whole post, it's really talking about, you know, she's grown, has this nice, she's changed a lot. People can grow spiritual energy and all that stuff. While her Twitter handle still is Suki with the good coochie. So, it's kind of a mixed message. I don't have a problem with the Twitter handle. Hey. If you got it, flaunt it, you know? But I don't think the tattoo, the machine gun on your ass, is that bad of a choice. But anyways, Drake. Um, (laughs) I'm such a fool. But yeah, people are loving this Blue Green Red song. People are saying it's got a lot of that controller, that views, more life vibe. He's definitely... 
common, I don't know, the, uh, look, I'm white, look, uh, I'm ignorant, I don't know if it's Afrobeats, I don't know if it's tropical, I don't know what it is, it has that nice, you know, do, 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 do. um, <laughs> dance hall type of, I think there's a dance hall sample or influence, you know, when Drake, uh, talks about headshots, and he's talking about, he's throwing subliminal, but it's very catchy, and it's like, It's fascinating because I think the appeal of Drake, now I've thought about it, it's not just the versatility. It is the up and down feeling you get listening to a song, regardless of if he's trying to go full on just rap, if he's trying to just go full on slow, melodic, or sped up, you know, or Afro beats, or... Uh, like Jamaican accents he's trying to do with that Canadian drill weird shit he mixes in. Like, he definitely does try to appease every single... And is it authentic to him? Sure. It makes people roll their eyes, but at the same time, there's part... It's like there's parts of the parts of a song... That will turn people off of Drake. And then there's another part of a song. That will make people. Love the song. And there's other parts like this. Like it says up and down. He makes you feel so many different things. And that sounded odd. But I think that's it. It's the up and down. Contradicting emotion. This confusing. That even as a grown man. This guy is still. Complaining about woman and stuff like that in some ways and you know but that's the fascinating part it's almost like the fact that he has a lot of immaturity to him probably as an individual I think that still is very appealing because no one wants to listen to a fully mature individual talk about problems because they're going to be sane about it they're going to be all self-accountable self-responsible you know Oh no, it's no one's fault but mine. Drake's like, you know, I admit, you know, I shouldn't have been out there, but at the same time, what you did to me made me a version of myself that I should never have to be, you know? <laughs> but that's the beauty of it. But I wonder what is the point. Like, what was the point of leaking all this info? Or leaking this footage of... It is fascinating. I have watched some of the behind-the-scenes footage of recording some of these albums, you know. And how, like, the process of making these songs. And what I pick up is when I've watched clips of, like... Behind the scenes of views, making it the behind the scenes of if you're reading this is too late. I saw some of the her loss behind the scenes, you know, footage documentary that he dropped. And you could definitely tell in each room the comfortability, how involved he is, his kind of place in that room, how different that album came out. And you could almost feel like the ones that he was so much more closely emotionally attached to than others. Like the Views one, in my opinion, I think the Views one is the one that he felt so like involved in. Like now that he wasn't involved in his previous prop, but it was like, it was literally just him, 40, and his input on every little detail, his rehearsing, his... Like, them going over the final track list. Him having, like, the little clipboard. Or not a clip, but the uh, whiteboard piece of paper thing. And them having the list going through, like, what they want to finalize. Them going through, like, the songs that are going to change the way people view Drake. And a different type of sound. Like, when they were talking about Fire and Desire, that's a lot of people's favorite, like, deep cut in that album. Um... Uh, keep the family close. Talk about how is as an opening, and when you go through like his mindset through, you can really tell the place he's in and the intention behind the album. And like really, like views was one of the first one. Not to make this the Drake segment, 
But I think a lot of people can agree. Like, Views is one of those where, like, on first listen and, like, the first, like, multiple times you're running through the album, you're not really, like, into it. But you like, like, the synchronization of the album. But there's not necessarily... There's a few songs that stand out, but it kind of all works together, right? But then over time, you start really, like, appreciating it more individualized. Because you have to be in really different moods to appreciate different songs by Drake or different times and phases in your life. And to see... The Views is one of those ones that has come to be like my second or third favorite Drake album. And that's saying something. And Her Loss was one of those that at first I liked almost at top to bottom, at least a good portion of the songs. And now, you know, it, it, you know, there's still songs I like, but the songs I really like when it came out, I don't like it as much. And there's some other ones I like more. But I think... Because the directional hit for her loss was definitely more of the teaming up with 21, making this different type of collab. He's trying to get a different type of respective audience. Talk Because if he's doing songs with 21, he can talk about certain things and get away with it because it fits the mold of the subject matter. He can mention Slaughter Gang, even though he has nothing to do with Slaughter Gang. You know, so, yeah. It really is just fascinating. Now, what well, we got to take all this stuff with a grain of salt. They're only putting out, he's only putting out footage that he wants us to see. And it is also weird to over the course of like 10 or 12 years to intentionally record this, all this behind the scenes stuff and not know why you're recording it. Like, I doubt he was like 10 years ago when he's recording behind the scenes of Take Care, Nothing Was the Same, and all this stuff that he's like, you know what? In 20. Like 10 years from now, we're just going to drop this randomly all on Instagram. And then people are going to screenshot this and put it all over the place. Like, I'm pretty sure maybe he's going to make like one big ass documentary one day where he could have profited a lot of fucking money on. Like, honestly, because if he would have made, if they would have made a two hour just smash up of videos, put in movie theaters, honestly, thing, man, that thing. If it's not out on the same weekend as like Deadpool and Wolverine or Avatar, one of these mega blah, blah you put on a weak ass weekend, Drake's gonna pull in like 80 million, 100 million first weekend, which for a documentary smash up video is just watching a guy making a fucking album. You don't think people are gonna go fucking watch that? It's the six god. Um, <laughs> uh, But I don't know, you know, just my thoughts, more life. Uh, Santanic music culture is fascinating to me. Is it, I don't know, if, but it is odd, right? Because there's obviously influence of it. I think it's undeniable. There's influence of Satanism, of really just anything to create a cult following. I think that's really like, here's where I've, here's where I'm conflicted. I actually don't really believe that a lot of record labels are forcing artists to become Santanic. I don't think like the head CEO or VP of most of these major record labels are like having these discussions with these artists or their producers or with their team, like. You guys are going to have to start worshiping the devil. You guys are going to have to start doing these rituals if you want to be, you know, given that freedom and to have your soul taken from you. So you just become this entity of a lack of a being for the world to follow and to fall in love and you become blind to what you're doing. I don't really think that's how it works. I think one, how it works a lot of time is... What sells people when people want to become very successful in a field? Sometimes, when you have such a delusional belief, or when you have, I don't want to say delusional because these people are good and talented at what they do, but when you have such a you will do anything to 
become successful at this one thing. And for a lot of these people, it's really like a last, it's like either this works or there's no real second career plan for a lot of these situations. You really have to be all in. So your number one job is to create a following. In order to have a following, that's why we have these Bay Highs, we have the Swifties. You got to have a monolithic, I don't think that's a word. I was trying to say monologatic. Mono, you have to have a very monolithic fan base where they are obsessed with either you, your personality, or something for them to be a part of in a quote unquote community. Now, good music. People always say good music will make you. It's like, yeah, if you're so fucking good, you can maybe just be good at music. But when you are pretty good, you got to find ways to continuously have a fan base attached to something. Music phase, people, songs of you will go it. You know, what are this too much music? You got to. With these shows like Trippy Red, um, Juice World, or which I didn't know Lil Uzi Vert. Apparently, if you pronunciate it, it's Lucifer or Lucifer. And those are more blatant live situations where they're doing very specific things that are obviously catering to that. Whether they actually practice the religion or is one thing or another. But they certainly have a conscientious direction of what they're doing. Because there's got to be consistency that sells. And certain music, like quote unquote, and I don't really like this term, but low vibrational music. Music that is supposed to make you dwell on your unhappiness all the time. And here's kind of my gripe with depressing music. People think that sad music makes sad people feel better. I actually think it has a reverse effect. There's, I forgot what it's called, but there's this thing where if you're dwelling, the reason why most people are unhappy is, I think it's like neuroticism, is when you obsess on everything that's wrong. So you become everything times 10 where... Things could be going wrong, but if you just don't obsess over it, things will naturally become better. Or they will at least, you will not just be focused on everything that's wrong or bad. So, when, shit, I lost my train of thought for a second. Um, But yeah, when you're just focusing, oh, let me think about it on. Neuroticism, focusing on what's wrong, blah, blah, blah. God damn it, Clint. Oh, you're creating, god damn it, fuck me. See, see, kids, this is why you got to continuously practicing your shit and stay on top of it. Because you know what? What happens when you take eight days off? This shit fucking happens, you dumb fuck. But, uh, you, it's really about, I think desperation will make people... Do things and turn into things to maintain being afraid to lose it. Because I think being a part of some type of establishment, whether people want to or not, I think what's weird is people are so anti-establishment, right? We are anti being a part of this company and that company. But then we want to be so attached to a belief a religion. I'm not going to make this about religion, but just for the sake of this. When we talk about Satanism or we talk about rituals or cults or anything that requires a belief in something of giving something up of yourself to trust something to overtake your issues in a way or to have a path of guidance. You're opening, no pun intended, you're opening a portal to really uh, 
attract a certain type of individual. And when you get sad people, because sad people are looking for someone that's listening to them. They're looking for a community. They're looking to be heard. They're looking to feel a part of something. And when you give sad people that avenue and it leads down to something like this, I think that's when you get this quote unquote low vibrational music, this sadness music. We're in this sadness epidemic. And I'm all about music, you know, talking about anything. Talk about things you're unhappy about, your depression and suicidal stuff. Like, well, I'm not saying commit, but you know, um, <laughs> but you know, talk about, oh, you know, eight years ago, you know, when my brother died, it made me want to do the same, but no one by my side, you know, that type of thing. Um, <laughs> I almost used a kitty claws to claw my eye. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah. I think do I th because like honestly like a lot like I've never understood and it's sad the appeal of Juice World I don't really get the whole appeal of Lil Uzi Vert um as there it's like the definition of like fourteen year olds that are being bullied or want to feel part like I don't think most functional human beings that are like. Loving to listen to Lil Uzi Vert or Trippy Red. Like, I don't want to sound insensitive. I'm sure there's people that like them. But if they're like your favorite artist, you may like a song or two, a song they have catchy. But they aren't music where that you listen to when, you know, life's going great. And I do think your music choice is for the most part not all the time but overall what you gravitate to is simply a reflection on kind of where you are at a point in time which also reminds me you know there was a hot topic that came up recently um i was watching a show with a special somebody you know i forgot the show but you know it's one of those cheesy shows where um their idea of, uh, which I've never understood the whole play date, you know, I don't understand why people think going on a date and trying to drown people in a pool is really fun or going to the ocean and think that, oh my God, we're in love. You can't breathe. Oh no, 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 you can't breathe, huh? Jumping on each other, kneeing each other in the fucking neck. I don't say how that shit's fun, but you know what? I'm not young. I'm an old fuck, I guess. I just never found the like, Oh my God, for the next three hours, let's just, you know, jump on each other and have fun, you know? It's like, okay. But neither here nor there. Um, but there was a girl, her brother. So there was a girl, one of her best friends. I think really former best friends, but they were still friends. They were once best friends, but now... She walked in on her friend hooking up with her brother. So, it opened up a discussion in my mind. And I know most people would be upset if you're a girl, you have a friend that's a girl, and then your best friend, that girl, is now with your brother, right? My thing, though... Here's just a crazy way of thinking about it. If you are friends with people, because simply like we want to say, your friends group is a reflection on who you surround yourself with and what you value. If you value having good people, your best friend should be a good person. If your best friend is someone you trust, your best friend you know is a good person, someone that you know would never purposely hurt someone, you know, wouldn't you want someone you trust and know to be with someone that's your brother, someone that you love and care about? If you have two good things together, it's going to be good, right? Now, I understand the weirdness is like, hey, well, 
if they're together, then me and this girl may not be friends. It's like, okay. But whether she's with your brother or she's with someone, random ass dude, you know, who beats the living shit out of her. Um, I'm just kidding. It doesn't have to be that extreme. Um, <laughs> say she's with some guy that, you know, doesn't treat her all right, you know, is into himself, kind of an asswipe, doesn't really care about anything but himself, you know, he's just kind of a mad type of guy, but you know your brother, you know your brother would do anything for her, um, you're gonna lose your friend in that situation anyways, because anytime someone marries someone they start seeing like you're not gonna be with each other as much that's just part of growing up that's just part of life right so best case scenario is that your best friend fucks your brother or your sister well man i ain't gonna say that that's weird it's only cool if it's your brother it's not cool if it's your sister all right that's where it gets weird like i'm never gonna advocate i know this is contradicting like, all right, now I'm starting to sound like a weirdo. But what I'm saying is, <laughs> I'm such a fool. But the overall concept of all we want is if we truly care about our best friends, we truly care about our loved ones, we should have, like, we should be happy when, if they were to happen to like each other and be in love. And not be like, you're my best friend. You can't make my brother happy. It's like, well, that's kind of selfish of you. Just because, like, I would rather lose a friendship if it means someone I care love gets to have the love of their life and be happy for the rest of life. Like, you know, that's part of life. Like, it's like moving out of your parents' house, you know. You, you, have, you have your own life, you know. And if someone's your sister-in-law or your brother-in-law, whatever your situation is, like, you're going to see them. You have a better chance of coming across them than if they were, you know, they had to move to Nevada and they married a gambling addict. And then, you know, he stole all of her credit cards and then, you know, took her social security, you know? And now she's stuck out there being a prostitute. Um, <laughs> it's just a real thing, actually. You actually walk into a lot of these Vegas casinos, and it's just blatant. Like, they'll be at the tables just waiting for people to win. They see you want 1000 bucks, like, hey, I know where you can spend 250 of that right now, buddy. It's like, yeah, but if I spend 200 for a room and then... But spend two hundred for you, and then I gotta tip you. Like, how does that work? Like, do you actually tip? Well, obviously you're tipping her. Um, but for prostitution, I gotta ask for the guys out there that participate in this activity, because I'm a novice. I don't participate in this nonsensical. Never have been. But if you pay, you know you have the upfront cost. This tells you how protected of a culture I've lived in. This is what happens when you're raised in, you know, normal parenting situations and don't have to live the rough life. Um, do they charge extra if you finish? Or if you don't finish, do you not have to pay? So how does that work? I guess it's case by case business, but still. I don't know. I'm going to stay away from that one. Because it does not matter for me. At all. I'm too cheap for that. Um, <laughs> uh, Jesus. But yeah. I am pro having your best friend be with your sibling. Of age. Um. I just think that if you would be upset about your best friend being with your brother or your sister, then that means that you admit that you're 
choice of who you have as your best friend is you're not friends with that person because of your values. If values is your main point of reason. Which, if you uh, if you surround yourself voluntarily with people that don't have great values, then you can't be mad when they affect your life negatively. So, that's neither here nor there. But I'm just saying, we should all be pro having our siblings be with our best friends. Even if it means we lose our best friends. Of age. Can I emphasize that enough? Don't be one of these weird, like, you have a 31-year-old friend who's trying to get with your 18-year-old sister. That's just fucking weird as fuck. If you do that, I will absolutely crush you with my thighs. Make you feel some real man thighs on your neck. Alright? I'll fuck you up. Um... (laughs) Think Chris Hansen's bad. Wait till these thighs get around your neck, boy. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah. Yep, yep, yep. But yeah, you know, just a good old typical day at the office. Losing earbuds, getting a phone, getting a chair. Oh gosh. And that chair, you guys will see soon, it is going to be a main staple. Let's just say. You're going to not recognize this studio. And by unrecognizable, I mean I'm going to have to lower the camera like 18 inches to get at camera level. But I'm going to be more relaxed. And you're going to be able to see my legs, which may be the most important part of all. Because that's what we need more on the internet. Man legs. Even as a man, seeing some good man legs, you know, I got to admit. It's nice to see. Not in a weird way. I always admire a man that works out his legs. You know why? Because it's hard as fuck. The legs and the activity of getting them hard. Um, (laughs) It's one of the most physically taxing things you can do. It is easy to go to the gym and only train from your waist up. Like You could go to the gym three times a week. Just train your chest, shoulders, arms, back. And feel fine. Like, you're, you know, you may feel a little taxing, but train your legs once or twice a week intensely. That shit will, that shit shows character. That shit legitimately shows character. Um, there's a lot of guys with bigger upper bodies and no legs. There's not many guys that have good legs and completely whimsical upper bodies. Typically, one works. The thing about building your leg, this is a this is a master class for the legs. Look, I've been lacking on the legs. You know, I haven't been as efficient as intensely. There's a lot of reasons for that: fatigue, having sores at the bottom of my fucking feet. But you know, I gotta. You know, the thing is, when you actually have a full time job, risk versus reward. You do got to start weighing out what are things that are going to take away my energy levels, my fatigue. What like you really got to think about shit a lot more. And I'm not even that old, but I am getting to I'm getting old enough where I can't just go off four hours of sleep and, you know, you know, eat cheesecake for breakfast. Like there's a give and take. I used to be able to my first job. No joke. I know, stereotypical. I worked at a McDonald's, bro. I'm not exaggerating. When every day for lunch, I made my own burgers. But, bro, I mean, we got one free lunch a day. Yeah, right. You work the night shift, bro. Bro, you be making the coolest fucking shit. Bro, I was as lean, as strong, and I had no car at the time. Like, I be eating, like, McDonald's. I be eating that Chinese takeout. Bro, I'm making eight bucks a fucking hour, and I was balling with no car. It's kind of a contradicting sentence, but when you live at home and have no expenses, bro, life's good. Um, then, and I, the kind of ties back to the guy at the mattress store or the furniture store. This man said some deep shit to me today. Not that I didn't know it, but you could feel it in his heart because man's lived a full life of it. He's like, yeah, the more money you make, the less you have for yourself. And I started laughing, like, yeah, hey, you ain't wrong there, my friend. (laughs) Um, But, 
you know, I, I would literally work. I would go to school in the morning slash afternoon, go straight to work, go walk to the gym. Dude, it's crazy to think. I've had a gym membership there for 10 fucking years. Holy shit. That's crazy when you think about it. Life really does go by fast. And like for three years, I never used that gym membership. Like literally just wasted fucking money. But neither here nor there. Uh oh, farting. Um, but. Literally, bro, I could get off work. Walk an hour plus to the gym. Saw some weird shit. Ran into a wandering elderly lady one night. Not yeah, near here nor there. I walked to that gym, bro. And I work out for two hours minimum. Walk home, get home at six, seven a.m. Wake up at noon. Like, then go to work the next day at two o'clock and do that every day. And I was full of fucking energy, bro. Like. It's weird how when you have less resources, you all of a sudden have so much more energy because it's like you're in this do or die. When you have more resources and everything's more convenient, you're a lot more relaxed, lazy about shit. Nowadays, bro, (laughs) bro, if I wake up, like if I wake up at 12, like I'm not doing nothing until three o'clock, like, or even if I do, like by the time I get home one, bro, I'm spent, bro, like. I, like, the aging thing, even though I'm still under 30, like, I'm still in pretty good spirits, like, but it is different. I think they say, like, you start feeling it, like, around 26 is, like, when you start, like, feeling that you can't just get away with anything. Now, there's some of you that can, but you have to be very natural. Like, 18, bro, you get it. 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, you can really get away with anything. Like, you know, 23, 24, you got to start, you know, you can't just do anything, but you still do a lot of shit. Get to 27, 28, 29. Like, you really, like, there is much more like, all right, I actually got to cook a lot of times. I've actually got to be more mindful of what I'm eating, the timing, the intensity. I got to really maximize my time. You know, I don't have endless time. You know, and I think when I get like 32 is when I'm going to hit that next plateau of I'm going to have to like, ah, oh shit, I'm going to have to go fucking vegan or some gay shit, you know, um, <laughs> but yeah, but hey, I'll have, hey, I'll probably get a new phone by then, right? Um, you know, it's crazy. Like, by the way, going back to the phone thing, I got to say this, this guy, he was a great dude, like honestly, great salesman. Wasn't trying to push too hard, but just enough where he made me think, like, all right, man. But he's really good. Honestly, great deal. But this man, he gave me, he's like, look, would you like to, like, would you like to sign up for the, you'll get three free upgrades in the next 12 months. And I'm like, if I'm getting a new phone, why the fuck do I need three free upgrades, bro? I just went five plus years with this janky ass shit with no fucking upgrade. And I was like, if I'm getting, I literally asked him, like, if I'm getting a new phone, why am I going to need three upgrades in the next 12 months? And he's like, nah, I know. You're right. I'm like, okay, then. Um, <laughs> like, is that how disposable phones are? Where we just like, yeah, I mean, you got four in a year if you fucking want. Who gives a shit? You know, just throwing this radiation around, the uranium. But yeah, I guess I'll end the pod with this, you know. Um, here's a quote I'm pulling out of my ass. Light years away equals an x-ray. Because you see right through me. Why is my battery fucking dying? But yeah, I guess the moral of today's pod is honestly, sometimes God has to make you drop an earbud for you to finally get out of your head. Damn, noise canceling earbuds really do a lot for you. But yeah, that's episode 294 of the Offbeat Podcast with Clint Nelson. I'm your host, Clint Nelson. Don't forget to like, follow, comment, subscribe to the notification bell. Most important, ladies and gentlemen, don't forget to suck some titties. And uh, 
Go get a phone. Go get a couch. And most importantly, uh, you know, don't look at your bank account. It make your life easier. All right. Have a great day.